Okay, hey, look, we've been uh, uh, looking at, uh, for a few weeks, a few now, um, 10 possible reasons, 10 possible reasons why you're struggling to hear from God. Now, when I hear from God, I'm not saying that, uh, that we all hear audible voices from God, but I do believe that we have the ability through the Holy Spirit to uh, uh, pick up the communication of God that God's to our world. Now, the number one way that God communicates to us, of course, is through, is through what we call the Bible, which is actually which is a collection of ancient documents that have been discovered and put together, written over a period of 1,600 years on years, separate continents, about 27 different differences. That book alone is a bit of a miracle. If you look into the history of how we ended up, we're very lucky to have it all bound together. Uh, I don't like calling it just a book. It's a book because it's way more than that. Uh, so the main way that God speaks to us, obviously, is through what we would call his word, the Bible. But I also believe that God that speaks to us in other ways as well. God is, God is limitless when it comes to creativity. And we see in these ancient documents, God's encountering with mankind, the God's the God's people in all different kinds of ways. You know, uh, there were people where he sent angels. There are times where he spoke through, through uh, uh, circumstances. There are times where he opens and closes doors. Uh, Jesus said this about his followers. He said, my sheep hear my voice. Jesus said that there's an expectation, expect, understand that you'll hear my voice. He didn't say how, say it, hear it, but he did say this. In other words, my sheep will pick up the communication that I send to them. Jesus, Jesus in John 16 and 17, speaking of the Holy Spirit, made statements like, like, Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. All tr- so he's going to take you somewhere. So, a gu- so guide, when, when you have a guide, a guide, a guide is in front of you, and somehow, some, usually visually, the guide takes you from there from, to over to that painting on the wall, and you follow that guide. So somehow, somehow, it gets you there. And this is what Jesus would say the Spirit of God would do. That, that, that through this, the Holy Spirit, he said, the Holy Spirit will take things of mine and make them known to you. That's communication. So we know from this this of ancient documents, and then we look at the book at the back, the first 30 years of church history, and we see God communicating to a bunch of people through various, through various different means as they went out into all in the world in obedience to Jesus and, and went to make disciples. So I want to say uh, uh, 10 possible reasons why you may not be hearing from God. God, please, I'm not thinking only audibly voices. I've been uh, following our thesis now for, what was it, 19, 19. 31, one. 31 years I've been following Jesus. I did not follow maths very well. It's very well, you know that now. But for 31, 30, I've been following Jesus and I don't think that I've ever had an audible, audible voice that I've ever heard uh, and I'm okay with that. But I'm, but I'm here 31 years later and I believe I've been leave up to the place where I am by following God and by my father communicating to me in a way that I understand. And I think that's a really important thing to understand too. Is that is that you have a children? Anyone that has children, children, you know the ways in ways to communicate best to them, and sometimes I'm different with that child than it will be than with that child, and and you know know that, that things that have to be communicated, you need to make sure that they get communicated. Um, it doesn't necessarily seem that our children always listen to us, until, right? But we always communicate. communicate. Well, I see some mothers and fathers nodding, There's kids dropping their heads. But if, if my children are out on a hike and they're walking down the road and a truck is coming their way, I'm not going to just say to them, say, watch out, there's a truck coming. Watch out, there's, oh, there's gee, that's messy. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go, watch, there's the, the truck up. I'm going to I'm going to make sure that my children hear what they need to do. What they hear. Now, what they do with it is their business. Amen? But as a father, I'm going to make sure they hear. And so I believe so I, God speaks to us and us. Make sure that we need to hear the things that we hear. That we, the thing is, sometimes we don't discern, discern God, do we? Sometimes we don't know it's God. It's, and there are 10 reasons we've been talking about talks to why I believe that people don't always hear from God. And so I'm just going to I'm just gonna recap the first eight. I want to finish today with the last two. So the first, the first one is you don't believe it's possible to hear, to hear God. And if you want to unpack these, and more, there's, uh, our, our message is a message on YouTube. You can have a look. But you don't believe it's possible to hear from God. The second one, one don't know what he sounds like. Well, he sounds a lot like Jesus. Number three, you are hearing, but you're afraid to acknowledge that it could be God. Maybe because of the consequence or the cost or what it might mean if you actually did follow what you believe God believes saying. Number four, four, God's not silent. He's just not communicating the way you want him to. Maybe you just want God to speak through an audible voice. But God's not God's speaking to you through an audible voice, but he's speaking to you through a whole bunch of other ways. He's the father, and he's communicating to you. Sometimes we can pigeonhole God. If God, if, if it's really God, it's got to happen this way. This way. And God's going, no, it doesn't have to happen this way. I'm a limitless, creative God, and I'm doing it this way. And so we surrender our surrender to his lordship. And we allow him to communicate commun- that way to us. Five, maybe he's already answered the question. He's already given you an answer to whatever that question is. Number six, you haven't done the last thing that he said. 
Maybe God has communicated to you, but you're not doing, not just asking, but you keep asking, and God's going, well, do the last thing I asked you to do, then I'm happy to take you on to the next, to the next step. Number seven, number seven, because he wants to develop your faith. faith. Silence is a great place to develop faith, isn't it? Sometimes, sometimes all the audibles and everything, and sometimes, sometimes we, just, we just, I wake up some day, so I don't feel like a Christian. Is there anyone in the room that in the room to that? I mean, I don't even know what a Christian, I know what it feel like, to be honest. I, 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 don't know, I don't know. But some days I wake up, and I might not, and I might feel like a Christian. But you know what I do when I open up my eyes, I remind myself, myself you know today I'm a child of God right now. God, I know you're with me, not because I've got a goose, I've got a hump, not because I fell over when someone went to me. I just know that you're my that you're father, you know, the hair's on my head, my hair, catch my tears in a, in a cup. I know that you know me. I know that you're looking at, looking at me with fondness, and I know that you love that you, and I know that right now, right now, in this room, whether I've got a goose bump or not, I know you're with me, and I know it by faith. I know when I pray, God, pray, sometimes I feel the real closest of God, and you just know that. But then there are other days where I feel like I'm literally speaking to a friendly ghost. But I know I'm not. And how do I know that? I know it by, by faith. That God is listening to listening. And sometimes, sometimes in the supposed silence, I don't interpret God's silence as his absence. His abs- I guess is the point that I want to make there. Number eight. We are listening for another rule. And we talked about this last week. We're listening for another rule, another deeper relationship. God is not a cosmic rule giver. He's giver. standing there going, I just want to keep bar- keep orders at you, telling you what you have, what you do, and what you don't have to do. You know, God, God wants relationship with us. Jesus died not so, th- so we could have access to a rule book. He died so we could have access to the Father who, in the beginning, when he made us, looked down and said, that's, f- that's good. That is very good. Look what I've done. Hey, angels, come and show us. Come people out. They're awesome. All of them. Look at them. Aren't they great? great. Even though we mess up. He still loves us. He's still for us. For us, he still wants to be a part of our world. world. And so maybe some of us we're always we're looking for that next rule or that next instruction. We're not just listening to our to our. Just want to have a relationship with us, with to just speak to us and just be and just us and so on. So I want to quickly quick power on. We haven't got too much uh, time left. Time power on. I just finished the last two uh, of the the reasons. Reason. I'm not saying these are. And maybe your story is different. But the, the, but there's the possible reasons why maybe you're struggling. Your, now, why do I want to start the year with this? With there's a very important reason. One reason I want to start the year uh, with this. this. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 34, verse one to four, when Jesus has been tempted by the enemy, enemy. All know the story. He's far he's forty days, and and, and and the and Bible writers say he was hungry. Hungry, gross understatement. Anyone ever fast ever for forty days? Hey, if I fast for forty days and somebody and some die, if I do a forty day fast and fast, you write my life story. Don't you? Don't say he was hungry. He was starving forty days without food. Cut food on. And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Uh, fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. Really? The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, Son of these stones to become bread. Jesus' answer is fascinating. He says, It is as in. In other words, I'm not making this up on the supper. This has already been written. God's already God said this. He said, It is written, Men do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. I would imagine after 40 days without food, it would have been very, would have been very tempting. Do you reckon to turn those stones into bread? Into, be brutally honest. Who feels like that? I was like it. I wouldn't have turned it into bread, but maybe a bacon and chicken and, you know, or something like that. I mean, that. God can do whatever he wants. He can create whatever, yeah, whatever. I don't know about bread, but I would have, turned, but I would have been tempted to turn that into something. Into, because the craving of the flesh, the desire that is flesh for food, 40 days, I am not just hungry. That's a gross, a gross statement. And I would have been tempted to do that, to, but Jesus didn't. In that moment, he didn't do it. So Jesus was making a statement about the place and the importance of God's communi- communion in his life. Men, I'll not live on bread alone. You can exist on bread alone. That's the point he's making. You, 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 you can exist on natural food. Your body, your body exists on natural food. You can go, you can life on natural food. But he said, I'm not said just to exist. I want to live. I want to live. Amen. And there's a difference between just floating through life and just simply existing and live. And, and he said, the key to living having some, uh, is somehow connected to God's communication in your life. Are you, here, are you from God? Are you into his word? Is his word getting into you? Says you die naturally without food, so you spiritually die without God's word. God's word. You may still you may still alive, but to be walking around, walking like a you know, the, there's this there's this influx. Anyone notice there's an influx of influx type movies on TV? I don't watch them. I don't like them. I'm not advocating not them. But there's this influx of shows about shows. You see the ads on TV. And I wonder how many spiritual zombies there are in the church. Good. We're just going through the motions. All we do is we sit in the chair, give our tithes and our tithings. We stand up. We 
but so are we living? Are we really living? Or are we just going through the religious religions? Because that's what Christianity does. A Christian looks like this. So let me tell you something. If you dive into the diet of God, you will see that I have no idea what no religion looks like. Because there are some weird, freaky, freaky people in there. But they love God, love, love them. Why would God use the people he used? I have no idea. Why would you why would turn up and pick those 12, 12 guys? Southern Galilean, backwards and back Billy type people. That's what they were. That's what they were Galilean hillbillies. Why would he pick them? He had all these plethora of religious people that he could have chosen. Cho- already knew the first five to six books of the Bible, memorized, committed to their heart. To their, they could spit it out whenever, whatever, whatever. Why would he not pick them? Why would he pick these Southern Galilean hillbillies? Billy. Why would he pick Peter? Who would just go off go mouth? Peter, Peter, Peter must have must had his mouth and his brain absolutely, absolutely disengaged most of his life. I reckon. I reckon. You know, I mean, he <laughs> comes to wash the feet. Jesus says, "I'm going to wash his feet." And Peter goes, "No, you're going to wash my whole body." Whole body. Really? And Jesus, and Jesus, no, no, no. You, you know, the, the, the feet. No, will wash me all. It's like, it's like back chatting, Jesus do. Stop it. You know, you know. Jesus says, "You know, you, you're gonna, you guys are all gonna scatter. They're gonna come and take me." Come and, take me. and Peter stands up and goes, "They might, they run the wusses, but I won't." And Jesus, and like, what? Come on, come on. You know, you're gonna run them. You know, the rooster's gonna go cockadoo, 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 cock. And you're gonna realize, I knew, I knew a bit more about you, Peter. And then you, then he's up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and you see Elijah and Moses come. And like, who, who would think to go? Let's build a tent. Seriously. But Peter but has to say something, doesn't he? He's just he got to say something. He can't just sit there. Sit, you know, he's a little brash with his word. He's just got to get it out. Jesus says to him that you know that you know that that you know the tempt is going to come. Is going to tempt you, and and you know when you come back to me, in other words, you're going to fall away and come back. And Peter's like, no, 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 I won't. It does. What what about what about and John, the sons of thunder? Thunder. Have you thought about that? The sons of Zebedee, of Zebedee, and they were called the sons of thunder. Anyone you anyone know that you read that? The sons of thunder. How, how, who wants to go to the church where the pastor is known as the son of thunder? I mean, it's not a it's not a thing, is it? It's not the sort of guy you want to go out with. Hey, I met this new guy at school today. His name's he's Tommy. He's a great Christian. Everyone calls him calls the son of thunder. It's like wow, thunder. thunder. How do you get a reputation like that? Like, well, there's one little window we had. Remember, Jesus was went in to go into Samaria. They didn't want him to come. And so the sons of thunder go, Jesus, would you like us to call down fire and burn these suckers alive. Really? These are the guys you chose, Jesus? Come on. There had to be, had to be people. That's, where's the love, the love, the peace, the joy, the mercy? The... No, no, let's burn them. Jesus, whoa, sons of thunder, whoa. No, we're not going to do that, you know? Seriously. Matthew, Matthew, Matthew a traitor to his own, to his people. Uh, ripping, extorting money out of people. I mean, I mean, Matthew must have had very low scruples. He must have had a pretty hard heart too, because he didn't really didn't seem to care what the Jews thought about him. He seemed to care what the Romans. I mean, these gone. These were not the picture perfect, perfect models of Christianity that most of us kind of think. We get this clean, clean, kind of sort of image, don't we, of what Christians are meant to be? Because what is a Christian? What is it? They're a good person. We're good. We're all good. We're all good. If you're not good in here, I'll question your faith. Hang on a second. We would recognize the faith of all 12 of them suckers. Yes. We weren't always good. Three years with Jesus and what was the best they could offer when the soldiers took him? They scattered and took off. Come on. Huh? See, here's the thing. God has way more faith in you than you do in God. You do. The early church has succeeded not because of not because great faith in God. God's great faith in faith. Because of that, because sitting here 2,000 years later, isn't that awesome? That awesome. Isn't that awesome? We get the chance to worship and to hear the word of God. And we're connected to the Father. And that message has traveled down throughout the generations. Not because men and women have been perfect and perfect held it, but because God has been imperfect people and done amazing and great things. Who's imperfect in this room? About, oh, about 20% of you. Jeez. I'll tell you what, this church is way better than the way I thought it was. You know what? The church, this church is too good. Even. Honestly, if we're that good, we don't want to ruin it. Hey? I don't want to get away of a good thing. So Jesus says man doesn't live bread alone. And he's actually quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. And I want to go back. I, want, I just want you to quickly want you to do this. Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 3. This is 3. Jesus takes this quote from. And he's what he says. And he's, God says, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today, today so that you may live and increase. And may enter and possess the, possess the Lord promised on earth. In other words, in other words, be careful, follow every command I'm giving you today because I want you to. I want you to live and increase. He goes on, he says, I want you to follow my commands, not because I'm a big boss and I feel really good, really good, I say. Anyone have a picture of God? 
God, God is just like he's just control freak. And he's, he's the God of heaven, and his job is job was a certain authority and dominion over all of us, all the humans. Anyone ever have a picture of God? There are probably people in this people that do, but you don't want to put your hand up. That's okay. That's okay. But we've got this image of God, that God is just sitting there, sitting there, and his whole thing is, I tell you, I tell you, you better jump. And if you don't jump, I'll crush you, Keitha. I'm just going to crush you. And if you jump, God goes, God goes, I'm still God. I'm in control. I feel good about myself because everyone's doing exactly what I think. That's not the answer so we get here of God. God says, be careful to follow every command I'm commanding you today. Why do I want you to follow your command? It's not so I feel good about good self or so I can wake up tomorrow morning and go, morning, yep, I still feel like God. I'm still in control. He says, here's what he says, he wants you to do it so that you live. You'll increase and you'll enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember, remember, Lord, your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his command. He humbled you, causing you cause hunger and then feeding you with eating manna. Anyone ever eaten manna? Doesn't sound like it was a real like a tasty meal. But anyway, it was food. It was in manna. He fed, he fed with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had ever known before. And he did it for did it reason to teach you that man doesn't man doesn't bread alone. Now, if he had have given them butter, chip, butter for example, right? If he had if he had them butter chicken, they wouldn't have got the point. The point. No, if I was there, I would have just gorged this butter chicken and thought, no, that's great, that's, you know. But he said, I gave them a gate, which none of you knew, and you go, ah, this is tiny. And he goes, that's right, because you're not going to be sustainable on that stuff. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I want to say to say. Do what I want to say to you. Do what I'm saying to you. L- listen, there's a connection. Connect. In other words, God's heart is not just, not just speak, you obey, I'm happy. That's what it's all. That's what it's all. God's heart's more like this. I speak, you obey, so that you can experience the blessing I intended for you. And folk, because seeing my children, it just makes me happy. Amen. God wants to see His children He's blessed. So that's why I'm starting to share with this this question. question: What is it that's stopping some people from hearing God? Because I know that we live not on bread alone, but each of in this room, you will live by engaging with the communication that God brings into your world, into obeying that communication. That brings Christianity alive. That's to move away from just a, 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 a Christian religion, which, by the way, Jesus did. Jesus died to give the world another religion. There were really millions of religions already by the time Jesus came around. There were religions were coming out, everything. He didn't come to give come religion. He came so we could break or break from religion and have relationship with the Father, a life giving relationship. That's the story of Jesus. Jesus. So I want to quickly finish now. Running out of time. Out of the last two possible reasons why you may be struggling to hear the voice of the Bible. And reason number nine: deliberate sin is causing static in your heart. Deliberate sin is causing static in your heart. Now I think there's a big difference between just between sinning. Hands up if you up your sin. Well done, people. Give yourselves a clap. That's all. That's all. Every one of us sins. Every one of us sin. And none of us are perfect. We have the power of sin has been broken off broken life. We, we are moving away from the dominion of sin. We're moving away from those things having grip on our life. The closer we get to Jesus, the more those more break off. But none of us are ever going to be perfect. We all occasionally have, occasionally have a wrong thought. We all occasionally ca- tell a tall tale. We all occasionally... Uh, uh, there are things that happen in life. Don't always give the grace that 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 should give, or the love that we should give. give. Or we, we don't always give full forgiveness, for unconditional. Well, there, there's so there, there are areas where we continue to sin. It's, it's okay. That's why we need Jesus. Amen. We are not, we are not. But praise God, He is. And deliberate sin is different. Different sin that sometimes, sometimes we all are going to sin. But I'm talking about about you know that what you're doing is deliberate, is wrong. You know it's sin. God's got His finger, He's on the pulse. He's saying to you, but you switch off to that, and you just want to just want going back to that same thing continuously over and over and over and over. And when we get into that state, that's we want to keep running back to that thing that, that can cause static in our heart and and and, and break up that ability to be hear from God when God's going to communicate with us. So, God wants dialogue with us, with a monologue. Sometimes we think prayer. Yeah, let's go and get before God. Let's pull out our shop and our list. And I'll just, God, I want, I want, I want, I want. You should, you should, you should, you should. Amen. Amen. If you would love that kind of relationship with your children, with your children it's just all one way. Some of you will probably go, yeah, probably go. some hands are going, oh, I'd love that. Actually, they talk back, they talk way too much. Relationships are monologue, are dialogue, aren't they? Not monologues. Husbands and husbands, it's, it should be a dialogue. We talk to each other. It's not one person talks, the other talks, you be quiet and just answer, you know. You know. Life is about dialogue. God wants us to have dialogue with him as well. 
Proverbs 28 and verse 9 says this. It says this. If anyone turns a deaf to deer, think about that. If anyone if turns a deaf ear to my instruction, even their even theirs are detestable. So here's what I believe deliberate sin is. Sin is, will turn your ear away from your father. From your father. We allow, and we keep going back to sin. You know, sins, we start to turn our ear away from the voice of God. God. We don't want to hear what God has to say. It says there that if anyone, anyone's a deaf ear, who's turning the ear away? It doesn't say that God's not speaking. It's that we're turning a deaf ear away. We don't want to hear anymore, God. Because God, because God, I'm playing this pond over here, and I know you're and I'm saying, "Don't play in that pond. It's not going to be, not going to, it's not going to end well." But God, I really, I'm playing that pond, so I'm just going to turn a deaf, turn a ear to what you're saying, so that I can go over here, go over, and I can play in that pond. It means God's speaking. We've chosen to turn away from His voice, from it's our doing, not His. So we've already mentioned, God not shocked about our imperfection. God knows that none of us are perfect. God knows that, and God chooses and uses imperfect people. When we were sinners, these ancient documents tell us, tell us, when we had no interest in God, because while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You ever thought about that? While you were your lowest point and furthest away from God, your thoughts were furthest further from God, your actions were furthest away from God. You had zero interest in God. God. At that point, God gave his Jesus to die for you. When you couldn't get any further away, God paid the ultimate price to redeem you and buy you back. Now that you're for him, how much more will he do? We're for him, even though even, even though we still sin, but our hearts are for him. For him. Our hearts are for God. His grace is amazing. His love is amazing. See, deliberate sin is sin, fruit of a heart posture that's turned its ear away from God already. That's what it is. Before, before sin becomes a deliberate thing that we keep going, keep to in our hearts, we've turned a deaf ear to God. Because when we because we're deaf ear away and we're not hearing. As well, we feel a lot better about going over there and playing in that pond. Anyone ever know? Ever, there's a Christian rap artist called Lecrae. Lecrae. Anyone trendy enough in the room to know Lecrae? Lecrae? Some of you young fellows, surely. I, I, I only know because I had kids. I had kids to him, but it's not, I'm not trendy. They were. So I, I was listening to an article, and, 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 and he was a big rap artist, rap artist and Christian, and won Grammy Awards and everything. That. And, and after winning a Grammy, he had sort of period where he actually turned away from the way he had a struggle of his faith, and he turned away from it. But he eventually came back to faith. To faith. And I heard him interviewed in a podcast, and here's what he said. He said, people, like people walk away from God, not because they don't believe in him, but because believing in him stops them from doing what it is that they want to do, which is sin. Think about that. Think about that. So a lot of people turn, and, and, that's, and that's what I think this proverb is saying. A lot of people a lot of turn a deaf ear to God. They'll want to turn away from God because, it, it, look, let's be, look, Bill, if God doesn't exist, life's a free-for-all. Free for, hey? If God, if God exists, there's no road tracks or track boundaries. We can do whatever we want and, and, and feel like there's going to be no eternal consequence to that. But God does exist and that changes the whole, the whole game. But if we can convince ourselves that God's not real, then we can go off and do whatever we do. Whatever we want. But guess what? It doesn't matter. God doesn't exist because I think he does. He just... He, amen? Jesus didn't die on a cross 2,000 years ago. I believe he did. Hey, he just... Hey, whether I believe it or I don't, it happened. It had historical fact. And God is there. A great illustration of how sin makes it hard to hear from God. We can see it in the life of David. David should have whacked this up there for me. Second Samuel, Second Samuel 12, 1 to 7. We all know the story of King David, right? King David is the king. He's got everything. He's in charge. Everyone, everyone David is what? What do you think of when I say King David? He's a... Oh, come on. David was a... a man, man after God's own heart. So, David has been immortalized as a man after God's own heart, right? right? That's who he is. Yet in David's life, David, there was this really dark period, wasn't there? wasn't there? It says that at a time when kings went forth, went battle, David went up onto the roof of his palace and he's looking around and he looks across the end. Oh, cheeky babe, look at her. Look at her. Having a bath on top, of, on top of a building there and he calls his people. Who's that? She's a good looker. Go and bring her to me. And he does. He does. She's married to another man. And David's inappropriate with her physically. With her. She gets pregnant, and then to cover up his cover up, what does David do? He, he, her husband's out doing what, what, what he'll be doing, out there fighting the battle. See, it's interesting. It says, at the time when kings go kings to battle, David was at home on the roof. Why was David there? It was the time when kings went forth to battle. Be where you're meant to be, you're meant people, and stay away from where you shouldn't be. Okay? David's where he shouldn't be. shouldn't get in trouble when you hang out where you shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. So anyway, David has, has been killed and so on. And then what happens is, one day, the prophet Nathan, Nathan fronts David. Have we got that passage there? Passage? So the Lord said, Lord, Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he, to him, he tells him a story. He says, hey, David, I've got a story to tell you. 
He says, here's what's happened. What's happened. There were two men in a certain town. One was and the other one was poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and sheep. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had brought. He raised it and he grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to her. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, he took the, he took the lamb that belonged to the poor man and he prepared it. He slaughtered it, he killed it, killed, prepared it for the one who had come to him. To him. David, David, David burned with anger. Eh? David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who demands is going to die. die. And then I love Nathan's response. Got the next verse. Next verse. Pay for that four times over because he did, he did such a thing and had no pity. And Nathan gets his gets fat finger and walks up to David and bases it in his chest and says, "You said you are the man." And he wasn't man. He wasn't like today's. Hey, you're the man. He was saying it that way. He was saying, "You say you are the man I'm talking about. You took that lamb. You took from the book for man. You took from somebody." And he exposed to David everything David had done that he thought nobody knew about, but God knew about. Now the point I want to make here is while while Nathan is standing there. The prophet, the voice of God speaking to David. David, guess what? David didn't pick, didn't put all. Why? Because he turned a deaf ear to God. And if we turn a deaf ear to God, it doesn't mean God's not talking, but it means that we're, not, we're listening to God. And David, a man after God's own God heart, because he ran after sin, God standing in front of him speaking directly, directly, couldn't even hear it. And that's what deliberate sin can do. Sin causes a static between us, us and God. It can hold us back from God. From God. James 1, verse 21. James, James he says, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent, and humbly accept the word that planted in you, which can save you. I, I, I read recently one theologian said that that word filth there in the ancient Greek is the same word that was used to use wax build up in the ear. Interesting, interesting. Get rid of the wax and wax stuff out of your ear so you can actually hear, hear properly. In other words, sin is like that build up, build something. It's a static, it gets in the way, in the, and it stops us from hearing from God. So if you're here today and you know that you have deliberate sin in your life, life could be stopping you from hearing God. What do you do? Well, here's do. What do you do. James gives us an answer there. Answer James 1.16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. See, God doesn't want you just to be... Here's the thing about your sin. You're already forgiven. You're already forgiven. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross, on the cross forgave sin. You have been forgiven. We don't, if we don't deliver sin in our life. It's not about forgiveness. God forgives you. It's about healing. So we can break the power of that deliberate sin in our life. And how do we get healing? Healing. Well, James says this. God gives forgiveness. Forgive by confession to others brings healing. Because we're bringing that stuff out into the into it. And when we bring it out into the light, into the darkness no longer has power over it. When we bring it into the light, we now have accountability. We have people that pray and pray for us and love us and will hold us accountable and accountable. It's not about getting forgiveness. Let me, I don't care what sin you've committed. You are forgiven. God will forgive you. God forgave you through the death of Jesus on the cross, cross a thousand years ago. It's not just about forgiveness. It's about getting healing. Amen? Amen? And how do we get healing? We bring it into the light. How many of you are in the soul, are in the deliberate sin, pray to God in a God, quiet place, you and him, you walk away, you walk it again. You go back to the private secret place, you and God, God, you go, you do it again. You come back, you do it again, do it again, and again, and again. You've already been forgiven. You've already been forgiven. What you need is healing. And how do you get healing? Confess. Find somebody in your world, somebody, somebody that you trust, that loves you, that you know is for you, know is for, that you can bring it to the light and say, hey, I've got this I've got this going on. Would you pray with me? Would you believe? Would you meet together? Can you hold me accountable? I never want to be free of this. Okay, moving on very, very, very. And the last one, number 10, 10. Tenth reason why you can possibly not be hearing from God, from God. And I could do a whole week on this. Week, I'd love to. We have no room for silence in our world. We have no room for silence in our world anymore. There was a guy who joined a monastery one year, and I remember hearing the story, and this monastery was like, they took a vow of silence, right? And they're only allowed to say two words every word, 12 months. So at the end of the first end of the months, he goes into the, 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 the priest of the monastery's office, and he sits down, and the priest says, right, what are your, what are your two, words? two words? He says, bed hard. The priest says, okay, no worries, we'll see what we can do about that off. That off. He goes back 365 days later, day, comes back in, high priest goes, okay, what is, two words, what do you want to say? He say, food cold. 
He goes, no, he goes, off you go. Come back in 365 60 days. Comes back in 365 days. Five, gets before the high priest. He says, what would you like? What would you like? He said, I quit. The high priest goes, priest, not surprised you've done nothing but win since you got here. You got <laughs> but we're not talking about a vow of silence. I'm, silent. I'm, talking, about, I'm talking about creating silence in our world. We are living in the most distracted time, time in human history ever. Smartphones, computers, computers laptops, tablets, tablets. TV, Fox, Fox, Netflix, Nine, No, uh, whatever all the other thousand and channel things thing you have at your fingertips. Once upon one time, anyone remember? Anyone alive when the TV first came out? I knew I'd get you there, Keith. There, Keith. TV first came out, and you know what? You know, there was one screen. Everybody in the house to gather around one screen. They're all focused on the focus thing. How many of you now? This is now experience. Say, hey, let's watch a movie. You sit down to watch a movie, and everybody's got their own little screen. Someone's on their phone over here. Someone's on the tablet here. Tablet. You've got a TV there. Everyone's on their own. We've got a thousand screens going on. We are so distracted these days. We don't have room for silence. In fact, we in fact we're in silence, don't we? We don't know what to do. Do we find ourselves in a moment of silence, silence, awkwardness, and somebody feels like they're going to like the silence because silence is a bad thing. Bad. Silence is a good thing. Good. Lost the art of silence. Silence. The early church fathers, the monastic the movements, they used to, they had these orders and these structures and these things where they prioritized moments and times and seasons, these are silence in their life. So they would quiet their heart and quiet their spirit and sit and listen for the communication of God to come to them. We've lost with the art of silence. We've had the story of Elijah going from the great victory at Mount Carmel, and then uh, Jezebel saying, Bell's going to come after you, and he runs and runs and ends and on the cleft of a rock and it says the earthquake came and that wasn't that God and the winds came and that wasn't God and this came and it wasn't God. All of a sudden, he said he hears a still, a small voice. A whisper, a whisper, the Hebrew says. Two things I know about hearing about whisper. Number one, if I'm going to hear if I he whisper, firstly, I'll first be really close to her to pick up the whisper. And secondly, it's got to be silent. Pick up the whisper. We don't have silence in our wants anymore. We need to learn to get silence get again. Mark 1.35, very early in the morning, while it was morning, well dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. This is in the middle of a revival, people. Go and read it. There's revival reviving out. When he comes down the bottom of the hill, some of the disciples are scrambling. They go, Jesus, where have Jesus been? Mate, the revival's booming here. And he just goes, there are other places I need to go. I need to just been with the Father who's spoken to me. I don't care about the revival. I care about the will of my Father, and I'm going to move on from here. He wasn't caught up in all that stuff. In the midst of revival, Jesus chooses silence in order to hear from the Father. Luke 6, 12 to 13, one of those days, those, Jesus went out on a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. The morning came, he called his disciples to disciples, and he chose 12 of them, of them, whom he designated apostles. Before, before major decisions, Jesus chooses silence in order to hear from his from and amazing. Matthew 4.13, when Jesus heard what had happened, John the Baptist, Jesus, Jesus had been killed. And the news of that comes to Jesus. His cousin has been murdered. It says, when Jesus heard this happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the credit followed him on foot from towns to towns. When feeling the grief of having lost his cousin, John, Jesus chooses silence and so to hear from the Father. And people, we need to recapture the art of silence. When was the last time you were silent before? Undisputed silence. I know we've all got reasons why we say we can't. Say we the truth of the matter is this, and I know this, and I know if I want something bad enough, I make it happen. It's that simple. Life is the totality of what I have prioritized. That's the reality of it. I don't know that reality, but it is. I have time to spend with God. Yeah, you do. You spend it on Facebook, probably. Or you spend it job, spend it or at the gym or whatever. I'm, I'm just being, I'm just, because I use these excuses all the time. All the time. But at the end of the day, the end of, my life is a totality of what I believe, what I full stop. I've got no other excuses, no other excuses. If it's important enough, I make it happen. Make it. And it's time, uh, violence alone with God important enough. From the night. Habakkuk 2, Habakkuk, he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent, silent for him. When was the last time you were still and silent before God? Psalm 610, be still. Know that I'm God. Be still. Just know that I'm God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. Isn't it interesting? You be still. Still, God says, I'll be exalted. No, but God, no, but I run around doing. No, no, no. Be still. 
and I'll still be exalted. Because not all of not us, he God. We're not. Amen. So there's 10 possible reasons why you may not be hearing from God. I've already heard from some people, some feed them on some of the other reasons. I don't know. You know, pennies have dropped for a few people and you felt like you felt like yourself in some of those places. I just want to, I just for us now, we've gone a little bit longer. Those of you that have visited today, we normally don't go this long. We just left a few more announcements this morning to get morning. But after we're about to finish up, we've got some tea and coffee and coffee, hang around, have a chat, uh, meet some people. I just want to pray for us before we go today. Go. Can I encourage you, if you're here and you don't, don't you've not bowed your knee to Jesus, you've not accepted you've not the, the, the call of Jesus, of Jesus, go and follow him. But maybe there's something in your something like going, you know what, I don't get it all, but I just all but like there's something about this. Maybe some of this stuff is true. Would you please grab someone? Maybe you maybe here with someone, or if you didn't, feel free to feel me, someone else. Have a chat about it. Start that conversation. God loves you, He's for you. You are valuable to him that he gave his own son. That's the value he places on you. The world will never place that value on you. You what does. So if that's so don't walk away here today without asking the question. The question. And if you feel like you're a believer here and the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you, can I encourage you? Don't just get up and run off and have coffee and stuff. Why don't you grab someone at the end of the service and say, hey, Leslie, here's what I feel like God's been saying. It's been me. I just want to share it with you. Would you pray for me? Pray. So that that seed takes root takes my life and builds and grows into something powerful. Amen. So, Father, thank you for this. Thank you for Lord. Thank you for our time together, God. So much to get through. Father, you are, uh, God, you are the center. Lord of our Lord of our God and Father, as we sang that song, that song about our heart, giving all of our heart over heart, Lord. God, that's that's what we gather, Lord. We want to learn, we want to grow more and more into the image of Jesus. We want to know how in 2020, 2020, with all the stuff going on around us, Lord, what does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? What does it look like to follow you at school, at university, at work? What does it look like to follow you in the industries that we work, that we work positions and the roles that we have? What does it look like what does it follow you as a, as a son, son, as a daughter today, as a mother, as a father, as a husband, a wife? What does it like? What does it, what does it look like to follow you, Lord? That's why we're here, Father. So, God, I pray, I pray for uh, each person here, God. God, these seeds that have been planted today, Lord, would you water them, would you fertilize them, God, cause them to grow, to grow into something strong in their in the Father. And Lord, for those that are those on the journey, those that are still worked w- w- out, God, I just pray, open their eyes, open their, open their hearts. God, would you touch their hearts in such a real way that they would know, would know that God, they might not have understood a thing that happened in this place today, but when they walk out, they would know they would, there was something there that they can't put their finger with. And Father, we ask that we are together in Jesus' name. And Lord, in the next seven, next days, those of us that do know, you do you give us the opportunity to tell somebody, somebody, somebody out there this week that doesn't know how much you love them, doesn't know what you've done for them. Give us the privilege and the honor to share with them about the goodness of God. And we ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Bless you.